three, two, one. Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Brennan Hodge, and this is uh, Citizen Health Talk number 17, Social Media and Healthcare. Uh, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Matthew Real. Uh, he is a double board certified physician that has over 100,000 patient visit visits under his belt uh, for experiences. And uh, Dr. Real, he's advised many healthcare organizations, um, social media, advanced technologies. Um, recently, he gave a talk at the Mayo Clinic Social Media Network uh, annual conference. And it was uh, icky guy, um, something that uh, Twitter apparently loved because there's a lot of good activity on there. So I'm excited to hear more about that and uh, his thoughts on social media and healthcare. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Real, I will turn it over to you. And if you need to share your screen, just at the bottom, you have that, that option there. Um, it's all yours. Okay, uh, great. Um, so uh, let me start off first, just the normal disclaimer, not giving medical advice or legal advice. I always have to get those out of the way. Um, I want to start broadly with a, a controversial statement, and then we're going to narrow things down, eventually down to Twitter and physicians, but we'll start very broad. I would contend that for most people, most of the time, social media can be a waste of time. However, for the people that have a clear purpose or a clear mission, it can be like mana from heaven. And the reason is, if you have a mission, then you're able both to listen to your audience and communicate with your audience with these multi-billion dollar platforms. So I think people should be very careful diving into social media without a mission. And uh, I think things like teenagers and young people on social media, you know, I think there may be issues with that. But uh, we're gonna first talk about what I mean by mission for all of social media. And then we'll get it more into Twitter, which is one of the areas I'm, I'm, I'm relatively uh, most familiar with. So there's a word, uh, it's a Japanese word, about a thousand years old, called ikigai. And uh, you can run across this word where uh, it was developed in Okinawa and roughly translates into meaning or purpose. And one area that you would see it would be uh, people who have ikigai can live to over a hundred years old in these small blue zone communities. There's a great YouTube channel uh, uh, there's a great TED talk on that concept of ikigai. Uh, a, a westernized version of ikigai slash purpose slash mission is a confluence of four things. Doing what you love to do, doing what you have the ability to do, providing something of value to the world, and providing something that the world will pay you for. So I think it's best to give you an example of that confluence. The confluence would be, say, Bill Gates when he was in his 20s. Loved software, had the ability for software, the world needed these types of software, and they were willing to pay for him. So for 30 years, that was his ikigai. And then when he hit in his mid-50s, his ikigai changed, and it changed to passion about world health problems, he clearly had the ability to do it. Uh, he has a business model around it. Uh, the world obviously needs it. So guys can change. Uh, uh, interestingly with Bill Gates, and we just mentioned to his Twitter account, he uses that concept on his Twitter account. He tweets six times a week, generally around uh, using his platform to help out these smaller groups all around the world. So when I talk to CEOs about their mission, you know, I would usually mention Bill Gates. Bill Gates has the time to do Twitter. Maybe you have the time to do Twitter too. And I, I would say that Bill Gates uses Twitter because he has such a clear mission. He says, why don't I go ahead and use this multi-billion dollar platform? So that's kind of the idea of Ikigai. Another example, Katy Perry, who has over 100 million Twitter followers, she loves the idea about enabling young women. She has the ability through her song and her voice and her music to, to express that. Uh, I think women, enabling young women in the world is something 
her world needs and they will clearly pay her for it. So celebrities are actually working from a place of icky guy. Um, now, why I think that's important, so bring this down to the real world, to, to social media. I think there's two reasons to establish your mission or your purpose or the icky guy. Uh, from a very practical point, if you are clear in your purpose or mission, you know two things about content. Number one, you have a sense of what you should be producing for content. Perhaps even more importantly, you have a sense of what you should not be producing as content. So uh, for me, my icky guy really revolves around understanding how health and health 3.0 technologies interact. So I'm interested in actual physical health and then things like AI and deep learning and social media and the confluence of that. What is not in my icky guy, my career icky guy, is say politics. It's not that I don't have strong political views, but they have no place on my social media because my social media uh, is devoted to my mission or purpose, which is not to be a political advocate. For some people, including some physicians, they like to be in the political sphere. And, and that's fine. But I think if you do that, you should be very intentional. Uh, and one thing that shocks me is these physicians, they have this great medical platform, and then all of a sudden they start weighing in on politics, I think just inadvertently, and I think they lose something with that. They might lose 50% of their, they might have a mission to lower cholesterol, or they may have a mission to improve vaccination rate, but they'll get into a political storm and right away they'll lose 50% of their audience depending on what hashtag that they use. So I think you have to, I think that the one piece of advice when, when I have a physician or an executive in healthcare come to me and ask me about Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or a podcast, I, I think 90% of the time should be trying to clarify what they are trying to do. Does it have those four parameters? Are they passionate about it? Is it something they can do? Uh, what is their world? And the world doesn't have to be the big world. The world could be their community. It could be uh, a community of physicians. It could be a certain community of patients. Uh, and then finally, what is their business model? If they can't ask the, if they can't answer those four questions, then you know probably they're not ready to dive deeply into social media. Um, a good rule of thumb, and and I use this all the time. If you do not have your personal mission statement written down in your pocket, uh, maybe on your iPhone, maybe in your wallet, you probably have not, if, if you probably do not have clarity of mission, okay? At least, and, and certainly your organization, if you go to any organization's website, they've, got, they've spent the time on a mission statement. But I'd contend for personal use of social media, it's worth an afternoon to clarify your mission before you dive into social media. And if you can't write it out or if you can't say it in one sentence to someone, you just may not have it. And I think then you'll get distracted with social media and less efficient with social media. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's, so that's the background of the importance of mission. I'm gonna stop here in a couple minutes to get some questions available, but let me just do one next part. Uh, let me just move this down to Twitter, for example. And Twitter is a platform, and we have some physicians here and some non-physicians here. Um, there are a couple advantages to, I think, to Twitter as a key social media platform. Um, uh, one, it, it is a very, it doesn't require a lot of time either to learn it or to do it. Now, there are lots of advanced functions of Twitter, but basic Twitter, you can ramp up on Twitter in 30 minutes and you can learn how to do things in 30 minutes and you can tweet in two minutes. I'd contend that other platforms like Facebook and YouTube and podcasts, they're, they're great if, if they're focused in the right direction, but there's a quite a big ramp up time. So for most physicians, most of the time, you know, Twitter I think is a good entry point. It's clearly mobile friendly and I'd say their platform is principally mobile. Uh, the one advantage with Twitter is it is a great social listening tool. And by that I mean, 
you may never want to tweet a day in your life, but if you construct your account appropriately, you can listen in a very organized fashion to people that you want to hear from. And for physicians, it might be certain specialists or specialist organizations. It can actually be a time saver strictly as a listening tool. It's also a great tool to just listen to community. Um, <clears throat> for physicians in particular, but for RNs and other people that attend meetings, there's not a meeting now that you go to that doesn't have a hashtag associated with it. And if you, if you prepare for the meeting appropriately beforehand, your social media strategy for a meeting, it is a great way to connect with people in the meeting. Uh, you're following hashtags, you can direct message them. Uh, I think Brennan reached out to me because of my Twitter activity. That's how he first reached out to me, all right? So it is a connection tool with a little bit of preparation. Uh, uh, I think that with lists are one of the keys we'll talk about later that make it highly customizable and, and make it a very efficient tool. Most of the time, if I'm looking for content, I'm working from my lists. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's also photo and video friendly. Uh, photos and videos are underused on Twitter, but nearly every time at these large conferences I go to in healthcare, I find that incorporation of photos or videos increases the engagement by a factor of five or 10. So if you can do a 60 second, a 20, 30 second video, you might have two or 300 engagements as opposed to a, t a written tweet. And sometimes a, a short little video or photo is much easier to create than actually a, a, a written tweet. Um, and finally, uh, from a systems point of view, if you look at Twitter, uh, if you're into control systems and engineering, and uh, I reach back to my old days about nodes and networks, Twitter is actually a connecting node. It can connect just about any platform that you want. So uh, it's very easy to tweet LinkedIn and YouTube. I think that's why it's so powerful as an initial entry point for social media. So any, any questions so far? Uh, no questions, but I will agree with all your points. Uh, I use Twitter the same way. Uh, yeah, I use it as my news feed. There you go. Where I get my news. <laughs> Actually, funny enough, when I started getting into more and more social media after I, I recommended a book in the chat there, um, I started learning about more and more. I actually signed up for the Mayo Social Media Network as one of mm -hmm. my first things and actually did the um, certification right. uh, that you guys have and everything. That actually pushed me to join Twitter actually just a year ago last week. So I've only been on Twitter for a year. It's changed everything. Um, my career path, the people I've connected with, I'm being asked to speak on panels now at different events and all of that because of Twitter and the ability to connect with people that I made more connections on Twitter and more like heartfelt and um, great connections in general in the last year than I've made on LinkedIn in five or 10. Like it's, it's crazy how much more powerful link, uh, Twitter is to me than LinkedIn. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it. I'm actually here because I caught up with John Chamberlain yesterday on Twitter because of an article I wrote earlier this week. And I caught up with Anthony on Twitter. I think we all connected on Twitter. All. <laughs> so you can did. see uh, that no, that's Matthew actually, and I did. Both Matthews. <laughs> I would also point out, I know there's a discussion about building community that even on citizen health, Twitter has been one of the more stable communities that has formed. And that's something to keep in mind that, you know, you have a community, uh, can you build it more via Twitter? Uh, so, but we'll hold that perhaps for another day. Okay, so let, let's go through some basics. And what I say, although I'll be talking about Twitter mostly, it should apply to other kind of general uh, uh, social media. Uh, so some basics. Um, I think for those of you that don't work for themselves, work for another organization, uh, I think it's important to look at your organization's social media policy. Uh, hopefully they have a written policy that can be reviewed. Um, you wanna make sure you're in compliance with it or if you're not in compliance, what you can do. Uh, um, uh, for example, can you represent yourself as an employee on your personal Twitter account? 
Usually the answer to that is you probably shouldn't, but there are exceptions, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Um, on, on naming yourself, now most of you have Twitter accounts, so I'll fly through these pretty quickly. It's nice to get to your real name as soon as possible. My name is at Matthew Rill. Uh, there's a debate on whether it's better to be at Matthew Rill or at Matthew Rill MD to put your credentials on it. Uh, I consciously chose not to do that. Uh, but there is certainly some advocates, particularly for physicians that are trying to really put themselves out there as physicians to include their, uh, include their, uh, their little letters, whether it's RN or MD or PhD or Dr. So-and-so, because it gives them more credibility. It might help them build community. Uh, uh, so that's something to consider. Uh, you want to try to get as close to your real name as possible. Uh, you generally want to use a real photo, a friendly photo. Uh, they have looked at Twitter before and, you know, follows. You're going to get followed more if you have a real face and a friendly face than a cartoon character face. Uh, uh, so you want to take a look at your photo, uh, establish a nice, friendly headshot and just make sure it's the one you want to use. It's nice to keep that photo consistent over different platforms, uh, but uh, use a real photo. Uh, think carefully about your large header background image. Uh, does it express something about your mission? Does it express something about your location? Uh, I would say <laughs> I'm about 95% solid on my mission, but I'm not 100%. And so my header is actually Mount Rainier in Seattle, just showing people where I am. And I haven't really gone to designing or selecting a specific header uh, because I haven't pushed my mission as specifically as I should. But you wanna take a critical look at your header and say, what does that represent? Uh, for a profile, there's a good book by uh, Guy Kawasaki on this. Uh, on your written profile, um, keep things simple and really express who you are. So if you're the CEO of Citizen Health, that probably should be the first thing on the profile, okay, because it identifies you as a CEO. Or if you're a founder, um, I looked at Megan's, she has a nicely written uh, profile, you know, it's clear uh, that who she is and what she does. And generally that should somehow be associated with your personal written mission statement. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> to, to include your business name in your profile, you know, I guarantee you want to get permission from your organization to do that. Most organizations do not want a privately owned Twitter account to have their organizational name on it. One exception, however, would be the Mayo Clinic, which encourages their physicians and nurses to have Mayo Clinic on it. But they're a very high-end group. They have uh, 12 or 13 full-time social media people. They have a lot of outreach within their organization. So they have a whole system in place to access all of their employees and they want their employees experimenting with social media uh, as Mayo Clinic representatives. They have internal training programs for that. So they are not your typical organization, but I would, let me turn on my light here. Uh, they're not your typical organization. Most organizations have one person uh, in marketing who's the gatekeeper for social media. And, and so, so you wanna understand what your organization thinks of social media and how you, and what your relationship is to it. And most of you are not working with a Mayo Clinic type organization. Uh, so, so just be careful with that. Um, talking about content. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> I tend to narrow my content to about 90% of mission associated content and maybe about 10% other. Uh, so, there are certain things I just do not tweet about. I do not tweet about patients. I do not tweet religion. And I do not tweet politics. Um, and once again, it's not part of my ikigai. It's not part of my mission. 
I will occasionally, to give myself a more three-dimensional character, I'll put the occasional video about my cat on there or, or my wife or something about Seattle. So, so I do try to give some personal touch. Uh, one of the examples I'll give further down, uh, he's the social media director for the Mayo Clinic. He consciously sees Twitter as a way to build a three-dimensional profile of himself. And, and so he's using that differently than say someone who's using Twitter to fulfill their mission. And we'll, you can uh, hopefully have an example of him uh, later. Uh, if, for example, you are very big on policy, I mean, if your issues are political and, and you want to get into the political game, then my suggestion is do it very consciously. You know, write yourself down some rules and think it through. Uh, really think through what hashtags you're on, especially. Um, one thing about um, uh, hashtags, um, there are, I, I consider hashtags to be either uh, non-controversial, totally neutral hashtags or political. I don't see a lot of difference. So I would contend that hashtags that include things like the NRA or MAGA hashtag or um, uh, anti-vaxxer hashtag, all ones that I would avoid, are political hashtags. Or, and, and when I say hashtags, I'm also talking about at NRA, for example. Um, if you want to enter that space, then you're going to be playing by a different set of rules. And you might get into something you just don't want to be bothered with. Uh, uh, for a professional physician with a medical license, that's reviewed by the state where you can be reported for unprofessional contact, I would be very careful before doing that. But I do know what I call citizen physicians who are advocating for certain policies. But they've gone into this very clearly. They've generally talked to their organization. Uh, if you're gonna be an ER physician to tweet about uh, gun control, I think you have an obligation to talk, whether you're doing that personally or not, and I understand about freedom of speech, uh, I, I don't think it's fair to do that without having a discussion with your organization first, particularly when there might actually be real safety issues involved on some, on some political positions. Uh, so I, I basically stay out of that space, but whatever your views are, if you're into politics, be very critical. Um, so, uh, Never tweet patient stories, all right? Now, whenever you say never, uh, for a personal physician account, I'd be pretty strong on that uh, comment. Um, HIPAA, as we all know, is you know, one of those uh, huge bureaucratic systems that are constantly on the physician's mind. But you cannot generate any content that can be related back to the patient. Um, I think that if you're not familiar with HIPAA, uh, there's a, uh, if you go, to, if you just type in Google HIPAA journal, that's uh, with uh, two P's, one A journal. And HIPAA, one P, two A's. Uh, one P, two A's, one P, two A's. And you hit, and then you do HIPAA social media rules. It'll give a very good summary of something you can take to your employer and review and your attorney as a starting point. Uh, but even that's not specific legal advice. But that'll, that'll ramp you up on some of the concerns there. And I, when I look at physician accounts, even when they're just kind of complaining about their day, you know, I could look, I could make a case that some of these tweets I see are actually HIPAA violations. And so uh, uh, I'd be very, and that goes with nurses, and that goes with other employees. Uh, once again, that's why it's important to um, uh, uh, to review your organization's policy. I remember one thing that I nearly did that could have been just a disaster. I was doing a quick YouTube recruiting video, and I was just showing people it's easy to do video. We can do a recruiting video in two hours, and I would walk around to 12 different physicians' rooms, and I would ask them, what's your favorite part about working here? And I would get a, a one minute, you know, 20 second blurb. 
oh, we have great parties or we love our patients. And I spliced them together and I had this beautiful like one minute recruiting video. It took me an hour to create. And uh, fortunately, uh, in the transition, uh, several of those people had computers in the background with open charts that I had missed. Yeah. And fortunately, uh, during the transition, I lost some of my digital clarity and they all looked blurred. But I was, uh, even inadvertently, just by doing a video with the screen in the background, I could have gotten, I could have gotten killed on, on a YouTube video. Uh, so be very careful about, about HIPAA and what your current rules are. Um, one thing I would, I, I'm going to intend to do more of next year, and I've started playing with, is to play around more with photos and videos. I think once you get through the process of, of doing videos on Twitter uh, and and using photography on Twitter, uh, uh, you'll get a lot more engagement. Nearly invariably, you get five to ten times more engagement with a a very brief 30 second video. So for a sense, if Megan or Brennan, uh, instead of sending out a tweet, just did a, a 30 second blast using a video, maybe with an interesting background for an upcoming event, you know, that might actually get more traction because people like short 20 second videos. I mean, they're just gonna go for that. So it's something to explore and try and see. And, uh, uh, there's something very fundamental about the face and the voice that's very appealing, and they begin to know you. Uh, so uh, short little videos on Twitter, uh, especially for things like we've got this upcoming event, or I'm really enjoying this, uh, um, probably will give you a lot more traction on Twitter for, for free. And it's actually faster sometimes than typing things out. Um, your, you can get more content with your phone than you can on your computer screen, oddly enough. So you can do a, a two minute video on your phone, but you can't do that on your uh, computer. It's just one of the, so Twitter is a mobile platform. Okay. So any, any, any questions so far? Good stuff. I think most of you, you know, it's good speaking to people cause I know you're all on Twitter. So you have a sense of it and, and I'm not trying to change your game. I'm just trying to nudge you to try a couple different things. Um, all right, so next thing, I just wanna give you, I think, the, the two keys for me uh, for Twitter. I've alluded to them before. But one is your lists. Um, so there, there's, a, <laughs> there's a debate about whether you should have a pure Twitter list and only follow 30 people. Uh, or you should just be friendly and follow whoever you want. And, and there, there are questions on both sides of that. Uh, but where I think you should put your effort in organization for your Twitter account, which gets back to your mission, is to create a set of lists that you've thought about carefully. And then when you do follow someone, put them in the appropriate one or two lists. Because then, if you want to tweet out something motivational and you have a motivational list, you're right there. You know, you know these are trusted sources. Uh, I have a list of, say, big thinkers where I can look at if I'm looking for some different ideas. I have a list on obesity medicine where you know, I only follow people who I trust as obesity medicine sources. So you know, that's one of those going to be one of those more time-consuming things. Getting back to Ikigai and mission, if you have a written personal mission statement, that list generation becomes much more tactical. It's not a huge endeavor, okay? Uh, if your mission is to say, learn everything you can about health 3.0, AI, blockchain, the semantic web, virtual reality, then it doesn't take much to say, okay, so I want a list that says AI and one that says blockchain and one that says vir virtual reality. And when I run across those people, I will put them in the list. Uh, but if you don't have your mission, then your list becomes fairly cluttered. And you know, I intend to clean up my lists next year, so I'm gonna do some list work myself just to save myself some time. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I think for efficiency, 
is thoughtful use of hashtags. And I specifically want to talk about conferences because I know we all go to different conferences here. So before I go to a conference, and Twitter is usually going to be my key platform of choice for any conference. So what I will do is I will set up a list for that conference, the typical hashtag list. Uh, uh, and that's going to be something that I track during the conference, either through Hootsuite or through Twitterific. So I'm going to be, hopefully, if I want to, choosing, uh, uh, I'll be in a position to flow through that conference. The second thing I do is about two or three days before, I will look through the speakers list and I will get a hold of both their direct Twitter account and nearly all speakers at conferences now are gonna have Twitter, Twitter handles. And I'll also try to find out either their hashtag or their employer's Twitter account. So if I'm going to say here, Mark Hyman, who's a physician at the Everett Clinic speak, not only will I retweet him, I will retweet the Cleveland Clinic. And what I'll do is I'll put those in a file in my, I happen to use Drafts, which is a, it's a very simple app to, uh, to just write words. And so for each speaker, two days before, I will have a little file for each speaker that has uh, their, uh, their Twitter handle, their employer's Twitter handle, and perhaps a pertinent hashtag. And so when I'm listening to them during the day, during the conference, if, if my intent is for the conference to expand my digital platform, which sometimes it is, then I will go ahead and tweet them with that preloaded information. And I think it's especially as a courtesy, it's like giving back. If someone works at the NIH who's giving a great talk, don't just tweet them, add and include the NIH. So they're, they know, oh, our star scientist is speaking at this conference. And if you do something like that at a Mayo Clinic conference or something, it, it can take hold and become somewhat viral. So it's kind of a, a good thing you can do with Twitter is you can give back. And it just takes 20, 30 minutes the night before the conference to, to write out some of these things so it only takes a few seconds to do these tweets. If you try to do it real time, you're not gonna do it. But if you do it the night before, you're prepared. So it's a good way to give back and organize things. It's also another way to physically connect with people. Because if you retweet a nice tweet to someone, it's a great introductory point to going up to someone who might be some big mucky muck and say, oh, I just retweeted you, uh, Deepak Chopra. <laughs> you know? and so, uh, so it's a nice way to connect. In terms of, and I learned this years ago, but in terms of, um, for those of you who are into control systems and network and topology, nodes, when they communicate to each other, there's a strength associated with that connection. And it may be more one way than the other. So my CEO, when he sent an email, everyone reads it. But when I send my email to a CEO, he may not quite read that right away. So there's a different strength of connection. So what I found with, um, with all social media, but especially Twitter, is if you can establish a physical face-to-face -face relationship with someone, then your digital connection goes up exponentially. So in my example with the Mayo Clinic people, Although I connected them all initially on social media, after I went to a conference and met them face to face, my value of that connection increased exponentially. Next thing you know, I was on the speaker selection committee. Next thing you know, they were asking me to speak. So um, try to make physical connections when you can to strengthen your, to strengthen your uh, digital network. All right, any questions for anyone so far? Uh, no, but just some comments. <clears throat> you really uh, hit the nail on the head with that last statement. You know, all these conferences that, that I go to, 
it's kind of one of the main things, main reasons I go is to connect, connect with people that I've been connecting with digitally. And just like you said, the value of that relationship seems like it just grows exponentially because now you can not only put a face like a human being, but a voice and a personality behind that digital personality. And uh, from my experience, those connections have been much greater since then. Uh, it's kind of fun too. It's like, Hey, I've been seeing you. I've been retweeting your stuff the past three years. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a uh, some people don't need resistance to meet, you know, have have no resistance to meeting people. Uh, but for those that do, it's also a great way to do that. Okay, uh, so I want to I want to talk about four examples, and these are all people that uh, uh, Megan might be able to put these up on the screen. Um, but I think these are people. I, I contend that a great way to learn about social media and Twitter in specific is follow and analyze your betters and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, one uh, specific example uh, is a, a man named, uh, he's a physician named Neil Flock. He's a bariatric surgeon. And uh, uh, the, he has roughly 100,000 followers. And most of what he tweets about is uh, obesity, the value of surgery and much of the new content coming out. So he'll, he'll be a speaker at obesity week. He goes to all the major conferences. He knows all the big players in the obesity community in the nation. Uh, I contend that's probably part of the reason he has a hundred thousand followers because people recognize that his tweets are going to have fairly valuable expertise. All right. So, um, so he's a good example of someone who's on a mission to advocate for bariatric surgery as an intervention or near cure for uh, 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 cure for obesity, uh, and he, just a good you know and and very valuable. Generally, uh, has uses evidence based medicine. A little bit of light tweets here and there, which which I think is appropriate. You won't see him tweeting about. Um, gun control. Well, he actually may have once tweeted about gun control. I shouldn't say that, but, but generally he, he has a fairly narrow mission. Another one, another 100,000 Twitter doctor uh, that most of you are aware is Eric Topol. And uh, I'm sure most of you all follow him or are aware of him since he really uh, is associated with this healthcare 3.0 blockchain AI community. Um, he also, he's not quite as narrow, but he's very futuristic and visionary. And he's very big on tweeting evidence-based articles and highlighting them. So he's a great source for a feed to understand, uh, to, uh, to follow what's going on. Uh, he has certain bias, I think, in, in some areas uh, that I've noted. Uh, but um, uh, once again, he's clearly fulfilling his icky guy and his and his mission uh, when when he engages on uh, on social media, and he's also a writer. So he's not just his platform isn't just that. It's he's also using it as a a writer's platform to develop expertise. So you can see his look if you look at his top panel, he's got his books on there. And he got, he's producing another book coming up and he'll tweet about his upcoming book. So Twitter can be extremely valuable if you have any desire to be a writer. Now, whether or not he has a mission statement in his pocket, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure he has a mission statement in his, in his brain about what he's trying to do. Uh, the next one is very interesting. Um, it's a, uh, Julie Silver, MD. And uh, she is a uh, professor at uh, Harvard. Uh, she's a specialist in rehab uh, for uh, cancer. Uh, she's the director of the uh, Physician Writers Conference that I go to every two or three years uh, where they talk a lot about social media. Uh, but um, she's also uh, uh, the head of a, uh, a yearly women's conference in healthcare. And uh, she, so she could actually tweet about a lot. She could, she could tweet about cancer rehab. She could tweet about writing. But the prominent thing that she works with is she works with uh, gender inequality within medicine and healthcare. 
And so most of her content centers around that. And, and this, is, this is, in a sense, it's, it's political activism. And she's going into it very intentionally and very clearly uh, and very, uh, it's not highly emotional. She, she refers to, and she's very supportive of women in that community. Uh, she likes to co-author papers in the subject, so she does research into the subject. Uh, one of the things she does is she may um, uh, research different, different organizations to figure out what their balance is of women authors versus male authors, and she will inform them and let them know. It says, you know, you are not publishing women authors in this field. Maybe you should take a look at, at how you're screening policies and applications. So, so uh, she's very good. Now she has uh, what ten or eleven thousand followers, but they're very. She's in a. She's built a community around this, and she's actually built hashtag communities around this, and is clearly one of the national leaders in gender inequality for uh, women. And uh, she's building her platform around it, and now has a conference surrounding that. Uh, the uh, the next one uh, is a friend of mine is Ferris uh, Timimi, and uh, he's the social media director and uh, a uh, cardiology a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic. is uh, is a cardiologist. He's he teaches. He's the instructor for fellows that specializes in end stage congestive heart failure and transplant. So he's a super high end dealing with the sickest of the sick patients, but he doesn't tweet about that. He's a, he's a Mayo Clinic social media medical director. So he is actually assigned as an MD to work with all social media for the Mayo Clinic, but he doesn't tweet about that. What he does is he uses Twitter to form a three dimensional picture of himself. So he will occasionally tweet about his family or the events that he goes to. Uh, uh, so he has a much softer Twitter account that isn't narrowly focused. Uh, and he's the one that came up with that term. I want to have a three-dimensional representation of, my, of myself on Twitter so people know who I am. Now, you notice he only has seven or 8,000 followers, and that's because I think it is a diffuse focus. But it's an intentional and conscious use of social media. Um, so anyway, so those are those are four examples that I think are informative, and that you can you can look at and say, what can I learn from those people? Uh, not many of them use video, which I'm surprised at, and I, I do think video is a lot there that we're not doing with it. Um, so anyway, to just kind of summarize, um, uh, one thing you might want to do is look for strong Twitter accounts and see what they're doing, and follow them critically as a social media analyst. And, and experiment with that. Uh, the second thing, and the final thing that I'm pushing for for myself next year, and it's one of my goals, and I'm working on my next year goal list, my written list, is I'm trying to become more kinder and more positive. Um, when I was a physician clinically practicing, seeing these patients, uh, you can get very wrapped up sometimes into things like outcome and is they're going to be safe and what's the best care and should they be driving and can I manage this patient at home with their blood clots and and I would have like 99% of you know you know I deeply cared about these patients not going bad and living and I deeply understood that this mother has a kid or this kid has a mother, you know, I cannot make a mistake in this 103 fever and I wouldn't sleep on it and I'd worry about it. But I, I was so worried about outcome that I tended to lose bandwidth on just being kind to people, you know, cause I was, I was putting out everything up to a very high level. And it, so I've had one regret leaving clinical practice. It's that I didn't fully use my kindness bandwidth mostly because I was deeply concerned about the patient. Um, and one of my goals is to be much kinder on social media. So uh, even when say, uh, you know, people can be very critical, maybe appropriately so about say insurance companies or about these big megalithic healthcare structures, you know, and I think there's a lot to criticize <laughs> about them. But, you know, I do tend to remind myself that you, when you meet these people, many of the people working with them are 
trying to do their best. And so uh, one of my approaches for next year is to be more uh, kind and gentle on uh, social media. And that's actually what I call my Twitter lution, <laughs> my Twitter Twitter lution for 2019 is a kinder, generous social media platform. The other thing I haven't fully committed to yet is um, uh, I actually um, disabled my Facebook account for next year. For one year, I'm just disabling it, including family. Uh, I'm it no longer serves my purpose. It's acting as a distraction. I didn't cancel my account because I still want to own my name and there might be a reason for me to get on there. However, I, I do intend to dive much more into LinkedIn. Uh, I went to a conference last year at an AI conference. And this is after the purchase by Microsoft. And I think LinkedIn is undergoing a substantial change for professionals and it's going to be much more AI focused and even now with minimal engagement they keep sending me you know pretty actually pretty good job opportunities even with my minimal engagement and that's one of their missions is to put really focused careers in front of people who really want them uh, so I'm gonna dive more heavily next year more than likely to LinkedIn and Twitter uh, and that's where I'm going next year Okay, so that's about what I have and just uh, my general views on social media and Twitter. And I'm open for any questions or comments and hopefully I, I offered a couple good ideas there. I think if you speak a lot, it's like a clock. You know, you, you might get two or, th two or three good ideas out there. Brandon, you're muted. How about that? Okay. Yeah, as you were talking, I took some notes and... Uh, I'm kind of in the same position right now with planning my mission for next year and, and what the mission for citizen health and really the, the social media focus building our community. So I took notes um, kind of around the ideas of you know, what are the themes going to be for the tweets that I put out there and you know, what ideas that am, am I trying to cultivate and uh, condense or uh, to share out there. Um, so, like I said, taking notes, and that's my strategy for the rest of this year, is to uh, figure out a strategy for next year. Um, so I definitely appreciate you sharing your ideas and your thoughts in there. And a lot of them resonated with me. That's kind of what we use Twitter the same way. And one thing that really surprised me is kind of right when you started to talk, is every single one of us right now listening that we're talking with, I think we all met on Twitter, like every single one of us. And as you got me thinking about all the relationships over the past year that I've formed, it's really all been on Twitter and I've taken that for granted. You really don't think about that. And, uh, you know, Facebook, I agree with you. I'm pretty much done with that. What was that, uh, that one saying? You know, Facebook is the family you were uh, born into and Twitter is the one you, the family you select. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Somebody uh, <laughs> um, I'll say for community building, uh, there. Uh, if you go to Simpler, and I know most of you are familiar with Simpler, it's a uh, healthcare website which lists and documents medical hashtags or healthcare hashtags. But um, there's a community around, say, an obesity chat group, which meets once a month, that uh, will have a topic. And there will be a fair amount of high engagement on that. Um, so, um, Twitter chats might be a light thing to experiment with, with minimal investment of time at, as community grows. Uh, uh, and whether that's blockchain healthcare chat or I hate EHR healthcare chat or what, whatever it may be, you know, there, there may be a way to use, since you already have, since everyone on Citizen Health at least in this group, already has um, a presence and comfort with Twitter, you know, that's an area where it might be relatively easy to build more of a community. So what's your advice on the trolls? Because <laughs> you know, it's, it's gonna happen. You know, once you start posting some, some ideas that, you, uh, that come from you, you're not just sharing things from other people, you're going to have trolls that come out and I see some people, they get drugged down the rabbit hole by going back and forth with the trolls. Uh, how do you, like, I don't know. How do you deal with them? All right. So, and, and I've been susceptible to that in the past, but the advantage of having your written Nikki guy 
okay, having your written mission, is you look at that and you say, is engaging with this person, does it help me fulfill my mission? Or is it just a distraction? And nearly always, it is a distraction. So you just let it go. And so, so I think that getting back to that starting point, there is a huge power to writing down your mission statement because nearly always a troll is to be ignored. Mm -hmm. Now there, there might, for organizations, there can be exceptions to that. And, and how you get, how can you use your organization to accept patient complaints on social media? Uh, that's, that's really a separate conversation. Uh, and there's also HIPAA concerns with those things, you know. So, so you have to have a system in place at an organizational level. But generally, if if their mission is to troll me, all the power to them. It's not my mission, you know. I I've got other life is short, and as you get older, uh, you know, being kind is one of my missions, and I don't want to upset anyone. Uh, uh, now, I, I also specifically avoid uh, a lot of the political hashtags, and that's part of the reason I do. It's not part of my mission. So I would ignore them. I think if, I, if you, can, there's, you can look through the Twitter, if you look a little deeper, and you can screen out a lot of words and a lot of people just by making appropriate lists. You know, a lot of four-letter words, you can just remove those from your time stream and you can block people pretty quickly. And so I'm pretty liberal with that stuff, but I don't, I don't really give them much time of the day. So this one thing you mentioned list, that's one thing that I need to work better on. Cause uh, lately I've been just going into my Twitter feed, seeing a bunch of random stuff. You know, some people tweet things that I find relevant, but without cultivating those lists, if it's just a free stream of people, yeah, it come, it feels like a water hose at some point. Uh, like coming out of the fire hydrant. So that's one thing I definitely work on is getting the, the list going. So I appreciate The it. primary Twitter app is not great for looking at lists, a little too many buttons. Uh, Twitterific is actually very good to look at lists. Okay. Uh, so the app Twitterific I find is, it's just very quick to get into your list. And it's what I use the most at the conferences. Uh, at home, I tend to use Hootsuite if I'm trying to track lists or names. Uh, on my big computer, but I like Twitterific for iPhone lists uh, uh, because uh, it's simply easy, very easy to get into them. Uh, what about for Android? I don't have an Android, so I'll defer to the Android people. Yeah, I'm Next not got me all wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing that, so I might have to try something else, but there's a lot of Twitter clients that I do see. So I'll, I'll experiment. <laughs> I'll let you know which one uh, that works best for that. I didn't realize there was that many Twitter clients. Anyways. One thing I, I noticed and just I've worked, you know, I, I have other brands that I have on the consumer side and stuff like the other companies I've started. Um, worked with a lot of influencers and stuff like that, you know, building followers in that case. The one thing I've noticed that's made more successful and actually, you know, um, Matt, you made a reference to it, is actually engaging with them. That's something that a lot of people do incorrectly on Twitter and all other social media. They kind of treat social media like email and an, an, an improper email where they just kind of blast out like, here's my thought or here's what, come buy something from me, do this they don't actually engage. There's all of a sudden there's questions or comments, people actually engage and trying to engage with them and the brands or the personal brands, you, you, myself and everyone else don't actually engage back. There's no connection there and it's a lost opportunity. There's other ideas where like Twitter chats, you can actually participate in them and you'll actually build your followers that way too. So actually engaging on these platforms is something that's honestly not utilized enough of. Um, same reason why when I've used influencers in the past on the consumer side, Influencers can have 15, I, there's one Instagram person I know in particular that has like 15 million followers. It's a huge thing. Hardly any engagement and when they try to push a product, not that great response from it where I have someone that has like 30,000 followers on Instagram which is small compared to 15 million. I get a lot more sales out of that smaller person because that smaller person engages with every single one of their followers and has 
a community built within that. So that's where that power is, is in that community that they've built. So a lot of times, you know, don't worry about the follower count, make sure you're engaging and build that community, meet them in person at these events and stuff like that. That's where you get that strong following. And that just grows and grows and grows organically versus just trying to do the follow unfollow game that a lot of people do. And you see it like there's a couple of healthcare brands I won't mention on here, but you see them follow you every couple of days and then remove them. Then they'll follow you a couple of days later. Again, that's it, it, usually via bots and stuff like that. But uh, there's a lot of great ways and engagement is something that I feel like is lacking on a lot of people's parts. And Twitter does monitor that, that game of follow unfollow and, uh, uh, you have to be careful with that because you might get disabled. I mean, it's against their it's against their rules of engagement, so to speak. So uh, um, uh, I I tend to follow reasonably liberally within my context. And if someone retweets something of interest, I will generally either retweet them. I don't use direct message very much unless it's someone that I know, then, then, I, then I do it. But uh, uh, so I'm not doing a lot of direct messaging on Twitter. <clears throat> I think to just starting a conversation, um, posting a question can be great to your community and getting people involved that way, getting engagement that way on some sort of topic, be it around anything. But I think that just starting a conversation, like even in the forum, uh, Matthew, you posted about the six minute walking test. That would be a great place even to start. So even something that you're interested in or you'd like some more feedback on, um, just posing a question and saying, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Or give me some feedback on this. Th that tends to open up and then you can start to um, pull people in that way too and starting to engage with them in ways that create conversation uh, and I really like that approach <laughs> the other thing is to video we definitely overlook video and even now with our health talks this is how you, you start that so you start to get more comfortable with being on camera and being in front of an audience and definitely your engagement will go up and I think we need to do that too in, in citizen health is to, to pull some more uh, just even short videos and short video clips but don't don't hide because this is a great way to build relationships and strengthen relationships through the use of a of, of video and it makes you too it's a person we can see more of your personality and who you are so don't be afraid and i, I would challenge everybody out there to do a very short clip 20 seconds and and, and be, be the, that be the base so start there and, and and take it from there but don't don't be afraid of it one uh, easy thing to, I think, help express your mission is see what tweets you have pinned and uh, have you thought through carefully what is the tweet you want to pin to your account. A pinned tweet is, uh, hopefully most of you know, is your tweet that will show up when people search your profile. And uh, uh, see, for instance, I have my recent Mayo talk, you know, I pinned that as my tweet and left it up there for the last month because that's something that I want to represent myself. Uh, and I may change that uh, soon and maybe I'll try to pin a video actually. But uh, uh, so think through, well, what, what do I have pinned on my first tweet? Do I have anything pinned? Do I have no mission? <laughs> so, uh, so look at your pinned tweet and that's a nice way to express yourself too. And usually the pinned tweet you'll see as you go weeks and everything else, you'll see the uh, insights or the engagement on the analytics increase constantly because it's the first thing people see. Right. It usually gets the most likes and the most retweets out of anything else that continues to grow. And then, you know, as you go, if you get into start speaker panels and things like that, one of the strategies that exists out there for speakers is, let's say you do a keynote or some type of talk that's 20 minutes, 30 minutes long. Typically, you can take that and break that up into some key talking points these little 20 second clips that you're talking about where you might have this great little sound bite. And there's usually quite a few great sound bites in that 20, 30 minute talk that you can now create a small video and tweet that again for months, different pieces and start conversations around all of that. So there's a lot of strategies utilizing because obviously you guys are, are more busier than I am. I, I just work from home. So I, I don't, I'm not as busy as you guys, but for, you know, doctors and, and CEOs and everyone else that have like the time completely busy, you can take one talk and just break it down for months and months and months 
and retweet it and do these other areas and, and have content for you for a long time to come. So it, it's other great ways to do stuff like that. The creation of anchor content. What is your anchor content? I 100% agree with that. And something I need to improve myself next year. Yeah, Anthony, I was going back through all of our health talks um, since this is the 17th one. Uh, that's over, that's a lot of, uh, so it's 17, 18, probably 19 hours of talking points. <laughs> a lot of good clips from a lot of different people. And I listened to some of them yesterday, just kind of just stopped in the middle of them and listen. And there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good speakers. I mean, over the past six months, we've had a lot of different people join us. So, uh, yeah, I think we should start to kind of break those to pieces and uh, see what we can use. So. Absolutely. You, you've had some great people speaking on here and doing those ideas and get a clip from them. You can tag them on there. More than likely, when you tag someone that's speaking and everything, they're probably going to retweet it. And you could tag certain key people, like when you're talking about posting videos and stuff like that. Tag certain people that might be interested in it. That usually gets them to share it more and everything else. That's all part of the strategy of just constantly going out there more and more and more. So um absolutely yeah there's a lot of great content from these talks here that you can absolutely just utilize that way you're not just sitting on waiting for the next one and other things that of, of that nature you, you there's a lot you guys can absolutely do and continue to grow like i said you guys have an awesome mission and everything else now it's just continuing to get out there more and more so on that note uh what we're we're trying to to build a community and we've been paying attention for the past six months. I've been trying to find the right platform to do that on. Went through a couple different forums. I'm trying to find something that's a little more longer form than Twitter, something that has more staying power where we can dig deeper into our thoughts and kind of iterate on that, have more conversations that are searchable and indexable through Google. And uh, like I said, we experimented with a few things, but now I came across something called uh, uh, Mighty Networks. I don't know if anybody's heard that. Uh, the founder of Neen, the social network before Facebook, um, started this. And we've actually launched um, a community on their platform. And there's a link on there if, if everybody wants to take a look at it. It's hq.citizenhealth.io. It's so headquarters.citizenhealth.io. It's really nice. Like, uh, I'm, I fell in love with this as soon as I started using it. It's really built for maximum community engagement. So you kind of have a news feed and messaging features, you know, post videos. You can actually have uh, similar to tweet chats. You can have live chats with everybody in the whole community. Uh, it's really neat. And uh, I, I think we're going to, we are going to move forward with this, to test this out. Um, just because we're trying to find something that we can call home for our community and bring people to. And this would serve the place of, of the forum that we have now uh, and our Slack, our Slack workroom that a lot of people communicate in and also our blog and potentially media. So I really aggregate people into one central location where we can just be up to date with all the events like this, you know, everything that's going on with Citizen Health. So we're going to announce that probably Monday. Um, to, so now if you want to, please populate it. <laughs> more, more members are better because once we do announce that, it'd, like, it'd be pretty cool to see some activity, um, but it's, it's nice. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's very cool. Make sure you point every opportunity, whatever social media you guys have, make sure in that respect, make sure you're pointing them to that so they know where to aggregate. So you know, absolutely, you know, make sure there's always some type of call to action in whatever you're doing, or at least on your Twitter handle and everyone else that, that pushing them to the area you want to aggregate them on. So but yeah, it looks really cool. It has a very Slack like look meets, yep. yeah, Slack meets uh, social media networks. That's pretty cool. It's uh, it's different, you know. It's yeah, yeah. You compare something. It's just something new and different. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited to see how it plays plays out. Brennan, what is um, what type of community do you want to build? Just Good question. Uh, community of, uh, of the digital community, and speci specifically, yeah. what's your? I would like to have <coughs> different groups of people, uh, patients who are fed up with the current state of healthcare and do want to see it changed and do want to play a part in that. You know, patients that want to have a, a greater voice in healthcare and also the caregivers that play a part into that and physicians as well. Um, people that uh, kind of really focus on the direct primary care side because those are the advocates for this model that we're trying to cultivate right now. Um, so starting with them um, and also developers out there. So I'm thinking, you know, the patients, the physicians and the developers coming together to build the software we're working on and really just to 
to rethink and rebuild a new model for healthcare. Uh, so, you know, I, I got that point in an email and I haven't responded back yet, but I do think it, it, it's a barrier to entry to download another app for sure. Uh, I, I don't know. I think some physicians would, would probably be, would be apt to do to join this, but you made a good point. Uh, LinkedIn groups are, are very big. And I do notice that with physician groups, that's kind of a past proximity. I think that would probably be best, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn groups and proximity. That's from my point of view, not too many on Facebook. Uh, so I don't know. We're, we're going to try to try to play it by ear and try to grow those communities first. Uh, people that are really wanting to come together and fix healthcare. To some I, I think, I think you're on the right track to experiment and say, how does it go? Let's reassess it and see what happens with it. Um, regarding my comment on LinkedIn, uh, um, now I'm thinking of LinkedIn. I don't think of LinkedIn. I think of Microsoft. I think it is uh, not any longer a social media platform. I think of it as an artificial intelligence platform for professionals. So, so I've rethought my view of LinkedIn. And uh, uh, three years ago, most people would tell you only follow and engage people you know on LinkedIn. But at these conferences that I'm at now, when they bring up LinkedIn, there's much more about follow people who are just in your field of interest. So, so I think there's a substantial change. I think it's something to look at if this other one doesn't work out, it might be a backup for a community because the physicians are already there. It's trusted. The software developers are already there and at least, uh, and there's a large group of professionals who are patients who are already there. So your community's there. You just have to get them on your group where with an app, you're going to have to cross that barrier. Uh, is it, do they engage you mobily? Do they engage you on, on the, computer there's gonna there's gonna be a barrier for physicians uh, but I think it's it's worth it it's worth a try you know, luckily on with this particular platform they have an easy joining feature with LinkedIn so you can actually share a link to to join with LinkedIn and it pre-populates everything I mean you know just like oh, okay. sign up with LinkedIn but it brings all your information over so your bio your Basically, everything that you see on your profile on, on here, what we have now is on LinkedIn too. So that's a, uh, they, they make it, they're trying to make it as seamless as possible. So we'll see how it plays out. And I appreciate all the support on that and all the advice. And I look forward to getting that going. Well, does anybody else have anything to add? Questions, comments? You know, if not, uh, Matthew, I appreciate the time today. Uh, open my eyes into what I need to improve and, and my social media strategy. So I hope everybody, we all do. Oh yeah. So I hope everybody else um, takes some talking points and uh, think a little bit on this to prepare for 2019. Uh, once again, I appreciate your your words of wisdom and your advice. And uh, all right, I will see you shortly online in the future, and probably tomorrow or the next day. All right, you guys take care. Have a good day. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.